afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue our study on the lines simply presented. And what we're going to do today is just go over a summary of what we learned in our 300 studies that we do in the morning as far as how the lines are structured. So in, in this, obviously, we're not going to be able to bring in lots of detail and the different arguments, but we're going to look at these, these lines. So before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have to study here. We ask your Holy Spirit to teach and guide us. We know that um, there's many who are watching these studies. We're trying to understand these lines for the first time. And um, I just pray that your Holy Spirit can speak to them and give them enlightenment, help me to present simply and clearly. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so what you see in front of here, in front of you on the screen right now, is what we call the cosmic line. So when we started this study of understanding the lines, I mean, the first thing that we had done, which we did in this study, was to look at the basic concept of what a line upon line is. Now, this, of course, is just a line. It's not a line upon line, except that this line is really an expression of the creation week. But as we know, that there's seven days of creation, and each of those days of creation uh, symbolizes a waymark. And those waymarks can be seen from the creation of the world at the beginning to the recreation of a new heaven and a new earth. So the basic understanding of these lines is that this is a line of judgment. And these waymarks are the plummet, which is righteousness. Now, God's dealings with men are ever the same. Uh, the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. And, and really what you have in a line like this is uh, a first message that arrives that's formalized and then empowered. A second message that arrives is formalized and is empowered. And then a third message that arrives. And then, just like we have in the seven heads in Revelation, you have an eighth. The eighth symbolizes the resurrection. And, and this is because in the creation, you have this creation. And then you have a falling away. You have seven days of creation. God makes everything. It's good. It's very good. And then we see the story of Adam and Eve. And so God takes this example or this template from the days of creation and uses it in the recreation of man. And that the large scope of that is this cosmic line. <clears throat> now, um, in each of these, uh, each of these waymarks, we see that there, of course, are reform lines. The creation of the heaven and the earth is a reform line in and of itself. The flood is a reform line. Literal Israel is a reform line. The cross is a reform line. Spiritual Israel is a reform line. The Sunday law is a reform line. And the new heavens and the new earth is a reform line. Now, when we began going through these different lines, uh, where we first started to get a much clearer picture was in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So I'm going to um, <coughs> move to the whiteboard here and illustrate things on the whiteboard. Uh, it's easier to do, maybe a bit harder to read. Yeah. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see that line. That's not, that's going to be too high. So 
So we have all these way marks. Right, so each one of these way marks uh, represents um, initially the day of creation, but all of these different periods. And one of the things that we have is we have um, a way mark, which we call literal Israel. Now, this way mark of literal Israel encompasses everything from Abraham all the way um, to the cross, because it literal Israel begins in this history with Abraham, and it's going to continue until this way mark here, the cross. But there is many, many, many reform lines in the story of literal Israel. But the question is, how do we get those reform lines? And what we noticed with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is we could have a reform line called Abram. One sec. Jacob. Right? And this would be your first, your second, and your third angel's messages. But there would also be a fourth, and this would be Joseph. Now, when uh, Jeff Pippinger originally had come to understand these waymarks in this way, um, he would see this fourth as really being something like this. So you'd have one, two, three steps in that fourth. That is, he would see that this is a reform one. Uh, what took us time to understand is that each one of these way marks is a reform line. But this reform line here that happens at the end, uh, this is something that we're going to address in, in a further study because this, this is something that's not well understood. But just the simple idea of this is... When you have the third angel arrive, you're going to have in the first generation a disappointment. And, and with this, you know, there's things that he has on the reform line, like the number seven after the third angel arrives. Um, and, and then you're going to have this first generation where there's a falling away. Now, how Jeff understood this initially is he would look at our history as if this was Millerite history, thus October 22nd, 1844, and then you have the Sabbath that's given. And he would see that our history is just a repeat of Millerite history, and that's how he would understand this. But we saw in other lines, and if we looked at this as the three decrees that commences the 2300 days, um, then this would be the history of Nehemiah. This would be Ezra with Artaxerxes the first decree. This would be Darius's decree. And this would be Cyrus's decree. So there's always in that first generation a falling away. And there is a fourth way mark that occurs. But that fourth way mark is, in a sense, uh, a falling away, the failure of this reform line, which is going to lead to a, a progressive destruction of four that's gonna finally lead to the reform line that really is the repeat of this history, or at least more closely repeats this history, is it's a proper reform line. In a sense, this isn't really a proper reform line. In a sense, right? So it is a reform line, but it's just not, maybe the way to put it is it's not a major reform line. But it's, it's hard when we do this to understand uh, these reform lines, because when we look at literal Israel, um, literal Israel has a number of reform lines. So if we were going to take literal Israel and, and draw the reform lines for literal Israel, we would have, just as we see above, seven way marks. And the first the first way mark would be what? What would the first way mark be? 
If this is the history of literal Israel, we would need seven waymarks here. So how would we do that? Because in, in the story of Abraham, there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, right? But these would not comprise this, this line. If you're taking this and you're going to take this literal Israel and see that there's a reform line here, that reform line is going to exist throughout the history of literal Israel. So how would we do that? Just, just in general, what would we do? Would it be the call out, out of you, out of Ur in, in, in uh, Genesis 12? Okay. So what we would do is we would take and say that we have the first angel arrives. And this would be obviously Abram, Abraham. I guess I'd do it this way. So this would be the first angel arriving, right? So we're gonna look at that whole story of Abraham, but the question is, is this then just Abraham? You know, and then, is, this, no. uh, is this Jacob, is this Joseph? Is that how we would do it? And if this is Joseph, then this is, what history? Right, so that that's the question. Well, it's their households, of course, and and the souls that they won that would join their households. Okay, I'm trying to find the diagram here. Stay in a sec. Yeah, so when we look at these lines, I know you probably can't hear me as good because I'm on the other side of this line. The way that we did it is Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, Israel, right? Because Jacob is Israel. And then we have Joseph. Now, can we see that Joseph parallels Christ? It's a well-known understanding. And then we have Moses, united Israel. Now, we don't have the judges in there. as, And then we're going to have the history of Ezra. Oops. That's how we did it, whether that's right or not. That's how we had come to understand this line. This movie. And, and there was lots of thinking involved in this. So this is just literal Israel brought down to the next level. Now, when we, we deal with Ezra, this is going to go from Ezra. It's going to include that whole story of Ezra, the three decrees, Nehemiah's decree as well. And, and it's going to give us uh, the start of the 20, uh, 2300 days and 70 weeks, but it's going to end with the 70 weeks. Now, that's going to be a, a reform line here. So the cross is going to have its own reform line. That's going to, of course, start with the story of Ezra. And then we're going to have the 70 weeks, which gives us this transition to spiritual Israel. So in the cosmic line, you have spiritual Israel here. And with that lampstand, it connected these two. 
of a flood was connected with the Sunday law. So we had a reasoning behind it. So I'm not going into all the details of how we came to understand this. And I'm not showing this properly here. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so if we can, if we can see that we do this, what what we then would do is, Abraham has a specific reform line that addresses him. Isaac has a reform line that addresses him. Joseph has his own reform line. Moses has his own reform line. United Israel has its reform line. Now I put here United Israel. Um, but this is going to basically be from United Israel. Uh, and maybe I shouldn't even say it's United Israel. I could put this as the kingdom of Israel. Because it starts with United Israel, but it's going to deal with the dividing of Israel. But the dividing of Israel, of the kingdom, in some ways, is a progressive destruction of four. So one of the things that we don't see clearly in, in how we had understood the lines is understanding the progressive destruction of four and what that means. Um, that is the four generations and how these fit into these lines. Because we know between the story of Joseph and Moses, there's four generations, right? So this, there's a period in here that isn't really a reform line. Yet, if we were to examine this, we would see that there are symbols that are attached to a reform line. Now, between Moses and the kingdom of Israel, you're going to also have the period of the judges. Again, this is a progressive destruction of four, but also many, many reform lines occur within these. Now, part of the way that we would look at this is that we would say, well, in the story of Moses, we can, we can draw a reform line. And that reform line is going to have a reform line that is what we would call a fourth, that is a falling away. And that's going to have four generations. But even in that falling away, there are reform lines. So we also would note that Abram for Abraham, that this is the arrival of the first message. Now, it has reform line way marks in it that would be like the third angel's message. That is, there are way marks in here that parallel the third angel's message once we zoom into this way mark and see the reform line. The same would happen with Isaac. The same would ha happen with Jacob. We would have these way marks. And a way mark that would be called the third angel arriving in the line of Abraham wouldn't be the third angel arriving in the line of Isaac. It would be some other way, way mark. So the way that we came to understand that is that in a reform line, when we're dealing with this whole reform line, creation, I'll put it all up here again, creation, the flood, spiritual Israel, um, and in this one, you're going to have the Sunday law that's going to line up with the flood. It would be a mirror of the flood. And then you're going to have the new heaven and earth, right? <clears throat> the new creation. So when we look at all of the, this way mark up here, this, these, this line up here, we can see that there's a period of darkness. And... What is the darkness here before God creates the world? Um, that's the uh, argument with Satan. Right. So it's the great controversy. And so we can see that this reform line addresses that great controversy, right? But yet that great controversy isn't addressed just straight off. It has 
all of this history, which is this, this increase of light that's going to happen after the fall of man. And that increase of light is going to be, uh, there's going to be messages that are given that give light. Some of those messages will be accepted, some rejected. There's constantly an increase of light, but also a falling away. That is, there are people that reject light. And so God, through, through uh, redemption history, is illustrating what happens in the individual life. So all of these way marks represent the individual life as well, the steps that occur, because these are really just an expansion of the seven days of creation. So if we go to this line, which here is literal Israel, and we parse this out, we know that in the story of Abraham, that there is a darkness here. Now this darkness dealing with literal Israel has to do with the promised seed, right? We know that the promised seed here at the flood, there's this promise at creation. And, and that seed is going to be preserved in Noah, his three, and his three sons, and of course his wife and his stepdaughters or daughters-in-law. But we're going to always see a falling away. So in this story, that promise of the seed is going to pass to Abram, right? He's now going to be chosen. And this is going to be about that promised seed. But from literal Israel, the cross to spiritual Israel, this is going to progress. Does that make sense to people? If you, if you understand what's happening with the darkness, then you can understand the reform line itself. But within that reform line, there are different points that are going to be addressed. We call them waymarks. But within that waymark, there is also a darkness. Now, all of the darknesses relate to this darkness here before the creation of the world. The reason that the world is created is to be a demonstration of God's character. In response to the accusations of Satan. That's why this creation exists. And so all of these events that have happened through, through history are illustrating the character of God. These are all about light. And it has to come in this way because man is not able to just accept the light all at once. And for God's character to be demonstrated, we need these, these, this history of the Bible. Now, in some ways, we could just say that these lines are an analytical tool that God has given us. Because we know he asked us to study his word precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And so what we are doing is we're setting in order, that's the precept, upon a line of measuring line or a line of judgment. And we're marking the way marks from here to here in time. And so when we study the Bible in this way, we are able to see things that we wouldn't have seen if we had just studied the Bible as we had previously. That is, we can see things more clearly. And God has also given us um, uh, time as well. So he's given us an understanding of chronology that has helped us in understanding these lines and their connections. He's given us an understanding of chiasms. All of these additional tools that really are um, an outgrowth of Miller's rules. They're an expression of the rules that were given to William Miller, which he got from the Bible on how to study God's word. We just understand them in this expanded way. <clears throat> now, in the story of Joseph, I mentioned that Joseph represents 
the cross. Or, you know, we could say this is just Christ, but I put the cross there. It's the cross of Christ. And we know that there's a parallel between in the story of Joseph to that of the cross. And in the story of Joseph, there's, there's, there's some chiasms. These chiasms first come with Abram, right? That's going to be uh, this period of time where you have 215 years and four generations, by the way, that lead to, and this is going to be in Canaan, and this is going to be in Egypt, and in Egypt there are four generations, and then you're going to have the Exodus, and this is Abraham leaving Haran, And this is going to be Jacob's entry into Egypt. Right. So Egypt, Jacob enters into Egypt. And this is 215 years. So this is a chiasm. And this comes from Genesis chapter 15. Where Abraham walks in between these carcasses of these animals in in the covenant, so we can see, and Christ is going to pass through those carcasses as well. And so this represents the cross, the confirming of the covenant with many for one week. And so we can line this up with the cross and, you know, three and a half years, three and a half years, right? 27 to 34 AD, right? So we can see that the story of, of Joseph is, is tied in here as well. Here we're just really talking about this whole history from Abram to Moses. But in the story of Joseph, there is a chiasm of Joseph uh, being sold into slavery when he's 17 years old. He's going to be 11 years in Egypt when he interprets the dream of the butler at Baker, which leads to a series of other dreams that are interpreted. Uh, Pharaoh's dream, I guess, is interpreted, but also the fulfillment of his dream that happened when he was 17. And so 11 years after butler at Baker's dream, 22 years after he sold into slavery, after his dream, uh, they're going to enter into Egypt. So there's going to be these 22 years with, and then there's going to be, he's 17 after they enter into Egypt. Uh, there's going to be five years and then 12 years, which is 17 years. So it's going to be 17, 11, 11, 17. And we know 11 times 17 is 187. Right? So the symbol that we have for July 18th is also in the story of Joseph. But there's also the chiasm. And in the story of Joseph, so I know this is stuff that we've done in other studies, but in the story of Joseph, we know also that he's 30 years old. And then there's going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And they're going to enter in to that into Egypt here, right? So on this side is going to be 215 years for Canaan and then 215 years in Egypt. Now we know with Christ, so this is Joseph, we know with Christ there's going to be 30 years and there's going to be seven years which he confirms the covenant, which is these seven years, crosses in the center. And then there's going to be a period of time here that is not two years and five years, but it's going to be two times 25, 504 years. This is going to go to 538. So we know this is 34 AD. So if you add... 504 years to 34, you have 538. That's 2 times 252. And then 
If we go five times 252, we get 1260, right? And that's going to go to 1798. So this is the plenty when he ministers on earth and then in heaven for one week. And then we have the close of probation for the Jews. And Christians and Jews are going to be persecuted for 504 years. And then that's going to be persecution by paganism, pagan Rome. And then this is going to be persecution by papal Rome. So these two and five years here are represented in that. Now, there's a lot more to this story, but I'm not going to, because we can connect the story of Joseph to the story of Christ by periods of 252 years. But, you know, we're not going to do that right now. The main thing that we can see is that there is this parallel in this line of Joseph with the cross. But we know that this is really, this line here is all this line. even though it's going to reach to the cross. It's going to reach to uh, this history. And then we're going to have spiritual Israel begin, right, in 34 AD. Technically, maybe you could say it's going to happen at the cross, but, um, but in a practical sense, uh, it's going to be when probation closes for the Jewish nation at the end of the 70 weeks. So at the end of this period of time here. But then that, that, that history of spiritual Israel is going to continue in a progressive destruction of four, the first four churches, until we have the reform line at the time of the end in 1798. So we can take all of this, these histories, and they all become wheels within wheels. They all become interlocked with each other. And this is the thing that, that we are understanding in a much, much clearer way than we had in the past. So that's literal Israel, right? We talked a bit about spiritual Israel. So when we deal with spiritual Israel, and we wanted to draw spiritual Israel on a line, we should have the same type of thing with spiritual Israel that we would have with this cosmic line itself. Now, we haven't really done this. That is, we haven't really fleshed out this line yet. We haven't really got there yet in our studies. <clears throat> but we can see quite clearly that with spiritual Israel, where would this begin? Where is the time of the end? Or maybe that's not clear. Uh, the cross? Okay, well, that wouldn't really be the time of the end. So so it's kind of, I mean, maybe it's, it's a trick question. Because, because if we're going to deal with this whole line of spiritual Israel, uh, we would have to recognize that, that there is um, a line that we would have, which would be more simply Christ, right? And this would this would start with the birth of Christ. But there, there is a reform line that we've already understood about Christ. But when we looked at that reform line about Christ, it's really part of the transition from literal Israel to spiritual Israel. It's kind of this history at the end of literal Israel, the cross is there and spiritual Israel is also there, right? So the, cro the cross is this, this bridge between these two. And so we, we could just say it's the cross, but what we would have to look at is what are these events in spiritual Israel? Now, spiritual Israel is going to end with, you know, October 22, 1844. I mean, in a sense, we, we could just put Millerite history and maybe that would be the easiest way to deal with it. Right? 
So you have Millerite history over there on that side. And we know that the, this history here is the end of the 70 weeks. So this is gonna be dealing with the 70 weeks. And this is gonna be dealing with the 2300 days. That no, being the time here. of the end. Hmm? That being the time of the end for both of those waymarks. Yes. So they both have a time of the end attached to them. So in this, this line, so that's part of the problem that we still have not completely sorted out is how do we, how do we look at spiritual Israel? I mean, as far as a line, what are the waymarks? What's the first message? So... So we'd need to identify what this darkness is. And then we could understand what this line is. I mean, the darkness has to do with the failure of spiritual, of literal Israel, right? The people that dwelt in darkness have seen a great light. So we know that there's this darkness here. And, and that is in a sense that the promised seed has been obscured. Now, somebody might even say, well, you know, we could take, this, this, and just go from the cross to the new heaven and the new earth and make that a line, right? And in some ways we can, we can, we can actually create different lines, but usually what those are, are zoom into some other line or some other way mark. So this is the end of literal Israel and the beginning of spiritual Israel, but this is where at this history, this is going to be the end of the 2520. So we have we have all of these different lines, and, and that's what we would have to understand. So we have a, a Millerite reform line that really is starting in 1798. So, so that Millerite reform line is going to cover from 1798 to October 22nd, 1844, at least, right? But remember, there's also a fourth, right? So you have three way marks. So we would say, you know, this is the first angel arriving. Whatever this is, we would have to mark as the second angel arriving. And this would be the third angel arriving in the history of spiritual Israel. Now, and we get, there's, complications in this because we know there's a falling away that happens that is there is the set messages of the seven churches and we could just just argue that these are the seven churches we could just take a line and say the seven churches represent spiritual israel and, and that wouldn't be wrong right so we could just go from here you know the christian church being established all the way to laodicea so that's one way of looking at it. So sometimes we can have multiple lines that illustrate a history. Now this history of the Sunday law, we just look at is our history, which is a repeat of Millerite history. So maybe there's other ways to do this, but we, ha we haven't done this line yet. We haven't decided on how to do that. Any questions about this? So I know it's incomplete, but that's that's what we would have to do. And somebody could argue, you know, maybe just the seven churches are all you need. Um, that Millerite history comprises uh, our history. So let's look at that, because this is what we've we've always understood. And that's why I put it as Millerite history, because we've understood that we have a reform line here, which we call Millerite history, 1798. We have a formalization and empowerment. That's going to be uh, 1833, 1840 more specifically, August 11th. We're going to have the second angel, so that's the first angel arrives, 
First angel is formalized. First angel is empowered. Second angel arrives <clears throat> on April 19th, 1844. We have second angel formalized. That's going to be midnight, July 21st. And then you're going to have the second angel empowered. That's going to be the midnight cry, August 15th. And then you're going to have the third angel arrives. It's October 22. Right? Um, now we know, of course, this line is the line that we've used in our history. April 19th, first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. And that's part of what we've had to understand, how we do that. Now we know, of course, Ellen White says, you got the third angel arrives. So you got the third angel arrives here. And it continues, and it's going to be joined by the angel of Revelation 18. The mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down at 9-11. So that's the history of the Sunday law. So one of the things we see here is we have this history of spiritual Israel, and we said that the Millerite waymark is the last waymark. But we know that there is a repeat of history. And this repeat of history is the history we call the Sunday law. It's the next major reform line. And this, this Sunday law history, we, we've, that's what we've been doing, is we've been zooming into the Sunday law as, we've, as this movement has progressed. And that's what we've talked about, how as we zoom in, we, we see more detail that is we're zooming into a way mark and we see all this detail that we didn't see when we were zoomed out and and we got confused about those lines we got confused what line are we really in when we're talking about a way mark so this this has been the major discovery of understanding these lines so this is the simplest way that i can see it we have god in redemption history, illustrating through all of these stories, the work of redemption. And we have this analytical tool, drawing things on a line and recognizing these patterns and structures. And we can zoom into any of these way marks and we can see these details because there are other reform lines. God's light is unfolding in a progressive manner to humanity. So we live in a time in which, in a sense, there's the greatest contrast between light and darkness. And God has given us light in clear um, in clear beams so that we can see the situation that exists in our own heart and in the world. That's what these reform lines are for. They're meant to reform us. Now, in some ways, they also are prophetic. That is, we know that the past illustrates the future. And as we pass through fulfilled prophecy, we can look back at the events on the past and it can shine in front of us to give light for our feet, to help us to make decisions. So these, these even though it's an analytical tool, um, its purpose is for us to understand. That's why we have these reform lines. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So. Okay. Now, I hope that's helpful to people looking at these lines. 
Um, I still have not got tons of feedback other than some people are, are happy that we're doing these studies. Um, and, I, and I don't think in this, this series of studies that I can go through and, and do all the reform lines because one is there's probably thousands of them. But we should be able to see the concept or the idea that's being presented. So, you know, for instance, when we look at some of these reform lines, switch this here. Um, you can see here's literal Israel, here's United Israel, which we haven't drawn out. But, you know, there would be, I would think, you know, if you're going to look at this line, it would be Saul, David, and Solomon. The second angel arrives with the death of Solomon. And then we would look at each of these, these histories. So, you know, this would be connected with the history of um, the Babylonian captivity and then, and then the freedom from the Babylonian captivity um, happening at the end somehow. So how we would see this, I don't know specifically how we would mark this out because I haven't, we haven't gone through this. Um, so maybe this shouldn't be United Israel. It should be um, um, the Kingdom of Israel. A terrible temper. Okay, so the Kingdom of Israel. And, you know, we could do that on our line above. You know, there's lots of lines there. So um, let me see. So this is spiritual Israel. And then it's, yeah, it's on literal Israel. That's where I want to go. Yeah, so I put United Israel here, but probably put the Kingdom of Israel. Now, just as this movement, as it has studied through these lines, we've come to see the lines more clearly. That is, we've made corrections. And when we've done that, when Jeff did it, um, many people would leave the movement. Every time there was new light that was being presented, um, there would be an accusation going out that Jeff was moving the way marks. Now, of course, he was identifying the waymarks. He wasn't moving them. So a waymark is, um, there's lots of things that it represents. We sometimes talk about the old landmarks. So what is a landmark? Has anybody ever seen a landmark? Yes. Well, it marks off from one plot ends and another one starts at that point. Right. Yeah. So, and and these are sometimes they're surveyors' uh, markings. They can drive a pole into the ground, and it'll have these markings. It'll mark uh, that location. I've seen them many times. Um, uh, when I lived on Crown Land, uh, when Matt was born, lived in a little ten by fourteen foot cabin. It was right by this little. Uh, landmark this little post in the ground with this uh, brass um top to it and you know had directions on it and marked what property that was that was my brother's property and we were outside of his property on crown land and um <clears throat> so that was the first time i ever seen one of those those surveyors uh markings but i've seen them when i was up in baffin island uh, when I was down in um, Oregon, there by Klamath Falls. Um, they actually call it a monument. A monument? Yeah. 
Right here. The, a survey's landmark. They call it a monument. Okay. Yeah. They don't. They don't call it a monument here. I don't think. Yeah. That, well, it's a. It's an engineering thing in the United States, I guess. Could be, but I've never. I've never heard it used as a monument. Um, you know. So I saw in Baffin Island down in in Oregon. So I can think. Uh, those are the three that I remember seeing. So usually you don't see them, right? Um, unless you know where to look. Well, they're here. They're usually covered over because um, they are normally used in engineering as to specify location for mainly um, streets and curbs and that type of thing. And then they locate off of that for the property itself or for the uh, foundations and such for the uh, houses. Like, like in cities or? Yeah. Okay. I've, I've never seen one in a city. but Oh, yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting watching them do it. Uh, some of these guys sometimes uh, dig down um, several inches to get to the monument. Oh, okay. So that they can, you know, uh, preserve an accurate location from a previous or from previously mapped um, coordinates. Okay. okay. Sounds interesting. But anyway, so what we have done is we've discovered these, right? We didn't move them. Would that be a correct characterization of what has happened in this movement? I would say so. Yeah. We haven't moved them. We just discovered more of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we didn't know about, you know, Boston. You know, hardly any Adventists know of Boston and, and Samuel Snow presenting there and declaring that it's the midnight cry, that he's at midnight, right? So we just didn't know about these things. So as we examined Millerite history, as we examined the foundation, we, in a sense, were also examining the landmarks, the surveyor's marks. And we were discovering things. And, and in discovering these things, we could see that the foundation was laid correctly. I agree. Mm -hmm. And so... It doesn't mean that we understand all, all of the lines perfectly. It doesn't mean that there isn't room for correction or clarification. Because we've done that all through this time in the movement. We've, we've zoomed in and we start to see things that we never saw before. But it would be wrong to say, well, we're changing our beliefs. Just because we have more insight just because we have more light, just because we understand the lines more clearly. So, so this is, I think, uh, you know, the major um, problem with the movement is that as we've been given more light on the lines, there's always a resistance. Now, we also had... Um, people who did move waymarks, right? Parminder moved waymarks. Mark Bruce moved waymarks. Now, why do we say that? How can we distinguish that they're moving waymarks, not just discovering new waymarks? Now, maybe not everybody's familiar, but did Mark Bruce deny the significance of 9-11? He did, right? He would say that 9-11 that wasn't where the light came, that there's all kinds of errors after 9-11 that he's then going to correct. Now, how would that be different, though, when Jeff originally had um, the parallel to August 11th, 1840 at November 9th, 1989? What would be the difference from what Jeff was doing? Maybe people don't know enough about what Mark Bruce was doing, but how Jeff then came to see that 9-11 represented uh, the parallel in Millerite history to August 11th, 1840. 
1940. How could we tell that that isn't a moving of the way mark? What's the difference? What's the basic principle regarding new light? An unfolding of, of old light. It's an unfolding of old light and it makes the old light shine brighter, right? Correct. That is when we examine the foundation, when we started going through Jeff's early material and we saw it unfold as it progressed, we could see that everything was much clearer as Jeff began, began to understand and unfold these way marks as the seven thunders were unsealed because uh, the seven thunders sealed up Millerite history. As we studied Millerite history, those thunders were being unsealed. And so we could then see clearly that the significance of 9-11, see, we didn't have 9-11 before. So Jeff had placed August 11th, 1840, in a parallel with November 9th, 1989, because he didn't have another way mark where he could do that. But once he had 9-11, it was pretty obvious that that was August 11th, 1840. But it still took time to sort through that. So these things will happen with our lines as well. You know, um, I mean, I like uh, getting things right. But I know that there's lots we don't understand yet. But anything that God will show us will not undo or unravel what has been done but it'll make it stand out clear. And we've seen that in these studies. We see that in, in, in the study of the judges, which you know, we haven't done here, but we did in the morning studies, we could see that it helped us to understand that 11-9, 2019, is September 11th, 2001. That is, those two way marks are tied together. And so we could take that second 9-11 that Jeff had, because he had 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel, paralleling with August 11th, 1840. And he had the second angel come down at September 11th as well. Right. But when he was doing that, he ended up with two 9-11s representing two different waymarks. But what we could see is that we actually had another line, and that's, 11.9, we could see that that is the arrival of the second angel. That is, it's a zoom into 9.11 as the arrival of the second angel. And it produces this these lines that we're in presently. So that line of the Sunday law is, is much more complex than Ellen White saw it. She saw it as there's this Sunday law in the future. Mighty angel of Revelation 18 will come down at that Sunday law. But we know the angel of Revelation 18 came down at 9-11. So we are in that history of the Sunday law. And this we only can understand by the way that we've come to understand the lines. And it makes everything clear. It doesn't get rid of old established truths. It just helps us see them more clearly. We can explain them more clearly. The lines that we had before are not incorrect. We just hadn't zoomed into them. In some ways, when Jeff put November 9th, 1989 as the arrival of, of the, the, the arrival of the first message, the time of the end, right? And he put August 11th, 1840 there. Was he wrong? Uh, not really. Not really. Correct. Because really what he was seeing was the mirror. Is it? Well, he was seeing 9-11 because he was looking at August 11th, 1844. But when we zoom into the arrival of the first angel, 9-11 is the empowerment of the first angel, right? Correct. So he never had that line expanded out. He just had the arrival of the first angel as 
you know, it paralleled with 1798, but also with August 11th, 1844, or 1840, I mean. And, but yet when you zoom into that way mark of 9-11-1989, then you do get both the formalization of the message and the empowerment of that message. So now you're just you're just parsing it out. You're just separating it out so you can see clearly what the first angel's message is and how the way marks that represent it. And the same thing happens when we look at the second angel. So once the second angel had arrived in our message and it didn't arrive directly at, on September 11th, right? It, its development came came along over time. We didn't recognize, for instance, that 9-11 was the arrival of the second angel until we actually came to the history where the second angel was actually arriving. And, and what that was, a zoom into 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel, is that history that we're in now. We're still in the second angel if in the parallel of Millerite history. We're still in the tearing time after the first disappointment prior to midnight on that biggest line under Ellen White's line. So the, the main line of the repeat of history. So hopefully that helps people uh, who are studying these lines. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? It, it has been helpful. I think it's it's helping to s understand this, what where we've been and where we're going. Mm -hmm. it's, it's giving us light for our feet. That's so. right. Okay, well, thank you. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this afternoon. And we pray, Lord, for those who are following these studies, we ask for your Holy Spirit to continue to lead and guide. Be with each person. May your angels watch over them. May you help them in their struggle uh, to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.